This episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for Curiosity Stream using the link in the description. Without the stars, no life would exist on Earth or any other world which might harbor it, but could stars themselves host life? Sometimes in science fiction, particularly in what we call space opera, where the science is very subordinate to the fiction if present at all, we'll see an alien race that evolved to live inside stars. At first this notion can seem rather fantastic, and indeed it probably is, but we'll look at some ways in which it could conceivably occur either naturally or by artifice. We will focus particularly on the idea of a star or stellar object being a conscious mind itself, and indeed that notion long predates science. Mankind has had a lot of deities down the millennia, but perhaps the most common is a sun god, Ra or Amun of Egypt, Apollo or Helios of Greece, or Sol of Rome being but a few of many dozen of such deities we have recorded, and doubtless there are more we do not. Indeed we name our sun Sol when we wish to distinguish it from other stars, and it is from that we get the term Solar System. Of course much of that would depend on what we mean by life and also what we mean by a star, both in terms of what counts as a star and where exactly a star ends and space begins. One might argue that just as life on Earth occupies only the thinnest edge of Earth's crust, Earth and the other planets occupy but the edge of our own Sun, whose total mass outnumbers all those worlds combined by 500 to 1. And as we'll see today, one example of a conscious stellar object that definitely can exist inside known science, the megastructure known as a Matrioska brain, while fundamentally run on a star in its basement, might well be far larger in diameter than what we usually define as our solar system. But we should start with the basic concept, as usually presented in fiction, that some entity or species dwells inside a star much like our own. Could this be? Well, not anything running on biochemistry to be sure, or any chemistry. These substances with the hottest melting point are still lower than the surface of the Sun, and while you still technically can have liquid or gas-based chemistry of course, without the ability of large complex molecules to form and persist, it's hard to imagine a complex self-replicating organism coming into being. We'll offer some challenges to that in a bit, but we must first mention that our Sun, for all that we call it a yellow dwarf, is actually rather large and hot as stars go. Indeed you won't hear yellow dwarf as often anymore, It's a nomenclature dating back to when most stars we could detect were unsurprisingly the brightest of them, and brightness rises with the mass of a star far faster than it diminishes with distance. Indeed most stars in this universe are red dwarfs, not a single one of which is visible to the naked eye, including Proxima Centauri, the star closest to Earth. Since we saw those biggest and brightest stars first, much bigger than ours, we concluded ours was rather small. And again we now know it is not, and the bigger a star is the hotter it is. Indeed many red dwarfs have a temperature of just over 2000 Kelvin, and there are a handful of metals that remain solid at that temperature and some alloys as well. You could for instance drop a ball of tungsten onto such a star and it would not melt. Initially anyway. The thing about stars is that when we refer to their surface, we're talking about where they become opaque, not some solid bit of star or a sea of fire. That is part of why it's very hard to say where a star begins and ends, and arguably it's much further out in space, all the way to where inner planets would be. At our Sun's surface, the density of matter is actually much thinner than the air we're breathing, and such a ball of tungsten would simply fall down till it reached a place that was hot enough to melt it. Though a sufficiently large and hollow one might maintain a total density lower than whatever it was at a depth where that sphere would melt and just float around. Most of the metals with that sort of temperature resilience are not the more plentiful ones. Red dwarf stars are also fully convective, meaning their contents bubble about and metals don't just sink to the center, so one could imagine some scenario akin to what we think might have occurred on Earth for protocells, essentially a big bubble forms of some substance and things begin happening in it. Tungsten and tantalum and rhenium and molybdenum might be the basic building blocks of life, as they could remain solid at such temperatures and many others would still be a liquid and might serve as some paler roar to water. It's quite a stretch, but we could probably make such a thing, so nature might too. I don't think beings made of hollow metal spheres are what most people picture when thinking of sun life, usually we think of something more like a phoenix, but most of us don't picture aliens as being made of a bunch of spheres either, even though that is not a bad description of us. 
Humans aren't particularly spherical, at least if they wash their diet, but plenty of the cells inside us are and you might get some truly titanic organism living in a star made of such building blocks. After all, stars are quite enormous so if your basic building block of life was meters across, not micrometers, you could still have such organisms without getting crowded. Especially inside a red giant, which are vastly larger than our sun but quite cool in their upper layers. Of course life might not need to necessarily run on chemistry either. Probably the most critical part of life is having an abundant energy source and stars certainly have that, though not so much for those coolest red dwarfs, who are so weak in their illumination that we didn't even know they existed for the longest time in spite of being the majority of stars. Presumably anyway. By modern theory you can't have a star below a certain mass needed to kindle hydrogen fusion, but we do have a close tier beneath the Red Dwarf or M stellar classification, indeed we have three nowadays, L, T, and Y. Class L dwarfs are either just barely above the mass minimum for hydrogen fusion or below it, a brown dwarf, and are cool enough to allow metal hydrides and alkaline metals. Beneath that we have the Methane Dwarfs, stellar class T, and these obviously can have methane on them and range between 550 and 1300 Kelvin, and I should note that while Class M Red Dwarf stars outnumber all the classic stars combined, these smaller Class L and T stars might outnumber them too, and since they live so long relative to stars, barring collisions they would only grow in number as time goes by. The more time you have, the more chances for life, if possible, to make itself pop up and grow in complexity, something we'll want to keep in mind when we get to discussing stellar remnants in a bit. Our smallest stellar class, arguably substellar, is the Class Y, or coolest anyway, the temperature and mass are not always tightly linked, particularly for stellar remnants such as red giants, but this class of brown dwarfs can be much cooler, indeed the coolest yet detected is cooler than Earth, though most of the handful we spotted are warmer. Needless to say if we're treating these as stars, or at least as stellar objects, A place larger than Earth and dense in material and about our temperature has to be considered a plausible option even for carbon-based life, and we would expect them to have an abundance of a lot of the other life-related molecules such as water, ammonia, and methane. We also have an entirely different type of star classification, the Class C or Carbon Star, a red giant whose atmosphere contains more carbon than oxygen. Red giants not being terribly long-lived and about as dense as what we think of as outer space, this wouldn't seem likely to spawn life either, but you might get a lot of carbon objects forming nearby as that star died back down to a white dwarf. A key notion where life is concerned, we aren't necessarily talking about what exists now either, but what may arise in the future, and as stars create more and more heavy elements, not only do we get more planets and new types of stellar classifications as we get metal virtual stars, but we get more time for life to develop. If the origin of life is a statistics game, the longer things go on and the more heavier elements you have, the more likely you'd see it arise in surprising places. However, we keep talking about life in a star, and should not ignore that many stars aren't really singular, they are binaries and often have quite a lot of exchange of material between them if they are closer. I could imagine some life emerging in such a matter stream between binaries, But more to the point, I could imagine a lot of smaller objects forming and hanging around such a binary as an asteroid belt equivalent rather than some inner planet like Mercury. In such a case we might see neostellar asteroid or comet clouds have life emerge on them and slowly form a natural Dyson Swarm around that star, or some life forming further out and migrating there as they developed a higher tolerance to light and heat. We looked at such notions more in our episodes Void Ecology and Space Whales. This is one scenario for a conscious stellar object to form, not unlike the notion of some ocean planet developing algae mats that slowly evolved into a single sentient planet brain, only at stellar scale. This might be much easier in a binary system where there was a lot of debris forming around and swirling about, both near and far from the stars, in very large and rich asteroid belts. Speaking of planet brains though, something we've noted before in discussion of digital consciousness or mind augmentation cybernetics is that the signals our neurons send each other move around at less than a millionth of light speed. So if you replace those neurons with some optical analog sending signals by light, a brain the size of Earth, possessed of the same number of neurons just very spread out, would operate at the same speeds as our own minds. Your typical white dwarf incidentally is about the size of Earth 
albeit far hotter, denser, and made of degenerate matter. They do cool with time and would also tend to have very large clouds of debris from their red giant phase hanging around. So we could conceivably see life emerge in a cloud around one, and given the size, it's possible that if those smaller organisms communicated at light speed, as would not be too bizarre if they lived in a near vacuum, that you could get something akin to a single big brain that had a communications delay on an order of the human brain. This is the big problem with mega computers built around stars such as the Matrioska brain. They have almost incomprehensible computational power, or thought capacity if we're thinking of this in artificial intelligence or digitally uploaded mind context, but they have immense signal lag time. Now if you just want raw computation and capacity, that's fine, it's only an impediment to a single large brain. Now Matrioska Brain is a specific type of stellar computation engine that relies on many concentric layers around a star recycling energy from the lower layer to be maximally efficient, but it's become a bit of a blanket term for any stellar scale computing engine. You can see the episode Matrioska Brains for details on why those layers are helpful, but if we just took the raw power of our sun and converted that to computation under modern performance per watt, you get around 10 to the 38th flops or about 10 billion trillion times what we currently estimate would be needed to simulate a human mind, or enough to simulate the minds of the current population a trillion times over again or a trillion times faster than now. That's very approximate incidentally as there's too many unknowns to bother with precision calculation, and because it's very unlikely we've reached peak computational performance per watt, indeed we're still only running at less than a billionth of what the Landau limit on classic computing is for Earth's temperature, and you can multiply that by at least a hundred inside a Matrioska brain, since that limit is temperature dependent, half the temperature, twice the computation with the same power, and a Matrioska brain would likely have its outer layers out past Pluto, where things were much colder, and be gaining around an order of magnitude more computation simply by the multi-layer recycling approach that gives it the name of Matrioska from those dolls within dolls, Matrioska dolls. Again, see that episode for details. However the problem there is that it will be very hard to set that up as a single brain as its various thoughts, even moving at light speed, would take forever to occur. As we said, converted to light speed rather than chemical signaling, you can spread a brain out to Earth size and have it run at normal human speed, but if we're talking a construct the size of Pluto's orbit to take advantage of the cold, that's around a million times Earth's diameter and means it would take a couple years to experience what took us a minute. Of course it could potentially have around a trillion 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 times the computational capacity needed to emulate a human mind, so it kinda cancels out and then some, slow but massive. Thing is that since Pluto's orbit is around a million times Earth size, that outer layer would have around a million squared or a trillion times the surface area, so it could be running at about a trillion trillion times the computation of a human brain in an area small enough to run a brain at light speed with human neuron signal lag times. Whether you want to run a trillion trillion simulated people in such a spot, or a trillion entities a trillion times smaller than a person or whichever, you have a ton of thinking without that light lag issue coming up that a single conscious Matrioska brain would have, so I suspect that would be preferred or possibly some multi-layered or multi-tiered hive mind. Now as we noted in Civilizations at the End of Time, in cases for using black holes or iron stars as your conscious stellar object, be it a single mind or many, As the universe ages that light lag issue becomes less important because everything is running at maximum cold on small sips of power, hyper-efficient but slow anyway. You can't take advantage of Landauer's principle of hyper-efficient cold computing unless you let your switches and chips cool down to that temperature before flipping them again, so you have to run slow anyway. And while they enjoy far more energy in the long term and far more efficiency with that energy, They have very little actual power, less than a light bulb rather than a normal star, so in the very late universe you might see these stellar computers or minds favor the singular consciousness approach as light lag just wouldn't matter, as everyone has to run super slow anyway. Now this is an artificial construct, though we could doubtless make something that was arguably organic, or at least self-replicating and conscious that acted similar. However this light time issue applies to any mega mind and is far worse for those using chemistry. The notion of a planet-wide mind evolved from some ocean-spanning algae mat is interesting but probably unlikely just from that huge signal lag, whereas smaller mats would be dumber but run at a more plausible timeline. In nature, unlike in the lab, 
brains are expensive and need to serve a purpose that enhances survival, and it's rather hard to imagine how a super smart but super slow consciousness could pop up. Even if it has no predators, which is usually thought to drive brain evolution, the predator-prey cycle, its individual components aren't just going to evolve and keep a mutation that let them link up to form a bigger mind, and pay for that extra energy and resources to maintain it if it isn't helping them survive. The same problem would apply to seeking to evolve inside a cold star or in a cloud of debris around one. I find it quite plausible we'd make life that lived in a cloud around a star, either a classic Dyson Swarm or some void ecology equivalent like we discussed in that episode. I even think it's possible, if not plausible, that such a thing could arise naturally from some organism that began in very low gravity environments where adaptation to the vacuum might be easier and necessary to spread out. That they might slowly disassemble all the rocks and debris in their system to make a natural Dyson Swarm to take advantage of all that light, with some semi-organic equivalent to ultra-thin solar panels taking the form of plant leaves. However, I can't see a single consciousness emerging over an entire star, inside or around it, either naturally or really even artificially at this stage of the Universe, and not because it isn't possible, and inside anything but the coolest star probably is not, but because it lacks an obvious survival track or advantage. Needless to say, for a civilization considering building such an object, that might not matter much and the motive is fairly obvious. While a single consciousness would be incredibly slow, and would presumably need to be composed of lots of levels of sub-minds to act like an hierarchy of a hive mind, the thing is about as close to a god as you can make under known science, and even its faster but dumber sub-minds many layers down, which we might think of as layers of an angelic choir or demigods for context, would each be beyond anything we can plausibly comprehend in terms of modern intellect. Such a thing is both awesome and terrifying which is probably appropriate considering how sun gods tended to be regarded by our ancestors, their literal artificial equivalents would be conscious stellar objects of incomprehensible might. We've a couple quick announcements but first, we were talking today about how you might host vast numbers of artificial minds on Matryoshka brains, but we recently explored the alternatives to artificial intelligence in our Nebula early release, After AI. In that episode we asked what a civilization might be like that abandoned pursuit of artificial intelligence or barely survived a machine rebellion, and if you'd like to catch that or our Nebula exclusive series, Coexistence with Aliens, you can try out our Nebula streaming service for free as a bonus with Curiosity Stream, which you can also try out for free using our link in the episode's description, curiositystream.com slash IsaacArthur. Curiosity Stream has thousands of top-notch and thought-provoking documentaries available for watching and during the current crisis they are offering a 40% off stay-at-home deal. If we're going to have to social distance ourselves, let's at least spark some curiosity while we're doing that. And again, you can try Curiosity Stream and Nebula out for free by using the link in this episode's description, curiositystream.com slash IsaacArthur. So I'm back from my honeymoon and Sarah and I had a great time, we just wanted to thank everyone for all the well wishes, not to mention gifts, that folks sent us. The wedding was a bit different with all the social distancing requirements, but as a silver lining a lot more folks were able to join us for the livestream of that than could have fit in the building. Lots of folks have been trying the livestream approach and I suspect that will be a trend that continues even after the crisis. Speaking of live streams, we did have to skip last month's but we have our usual monthly live stream Q&A to close out the month, Sunday, May 31st. Before that though, we've got two more episodes, starting this Thursday with a look at antimatter, how we can produce and store it, and what uses it might have besides blowing things up. Then the week after that we will return to the Alien Civilization series to consider the notion of aliens who come in peace, and actually mean it, in Benevolent Aliens. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to support future episodes you can donate to us at Patreon or our website, IsaacArthur.net, linked in the episode description. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.